I'm really pleased that you've joined us for this Aviation Safety Education Program tonight. MentorLive is a live video platform where NAFI professional educators present topics of interest for flight instructors and all aviators, free of charge. Before we begin this broadcast, I'd like to mention a few of the features you'll find in each of our MentorLive programs. First, we're broadcasting in four formats to accommodate the wide variety of internet speeds available to our viewers. Yeah. If you're set to auto, <clears throat> if you're set to auto, the video stream will adjust to your particular That's environment. My things about to die. I had to call Apple. It was at sixty-seven percent. Uh, it came down. Now it's down to twenty-three um, percent. Video will do that though. If you have a fast yeah. internet service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry about that. If you have a fast internet service, then you may want to watch this program in full HD on a big screen at home with your students, or at your flight school, or anywhere a group of aviators may gather. We broadcast Mentor Live on the third Wednesday of each month. For your convenience, each broadcast is archived for viewing 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year on virtually any internet connected device. Access to the live <clears throat> and archive broadcast is available on, your, on our website at nafinet.org. Just click on the Mentor Live link shown here. The Mentor Live page will list the upcoming broadcasts and archive broadcasts. Please feel free to share these links with your students and aviation friends. We broadcast each program on the Mentor Live page at nafinet.org and on the NAFI Facebook page for your convenience. During the live broadcast, the presenters will do their best to answer any question you post on e to either site. We, are, we really love to hear from you during the broadcast. This course qualifies for credit in the Fast Team Wings program. Now, for those of you viewing during the 2019 partial government closure, the quiz will be available at a later date. We will post the link <clears throat> on the course page when it becomes available. If you registered to attend the live broadcast, you will receive an email notice that the quiz is, is activated. Thanks for your patience on this. We appreciate your comments to help us provide the programming you want and need. Please complete the course evaluation <clears throat> at the end to help us learn about your experience and suggestions for Mentor Alive. And to show our appreciation for your extra effort, each completed course evaluation qualifies for a chance to win a free NAFI 50th anniversary shirt. Our program this evening is Telling a Student No by Gary Reeves. Gary Reeves is an ATP, a Master CFI, double I, MEI with over 7,500 hours. In the last two years, he's taught in over 30 states and is one of the most popular national public speakers on aviation safety. Gary's driving goal is to reduce general aviation accidents through free FAA safety courses, video training, and articles. He is chief safety officer and owner of pilotsafety.org and chief flight instructor and owner of Master Flight Training. To learn more about Gary, please visit his website at www.pilotsafety.org. And with that, Gary, we're really glad to have you here tonight. How are you? Woohoo! <laughs> so uh, you'll you'll be sending that check right there, Bob. There you go. Yeah. There, there, there's an inside joke uh, joke for everybody that missed it. Uh, hey, great! How about you all? Everybody good on that side? Yeah, we're great. Looking forward to hearing from you. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. You know, when I was a brand new instructor a long time ago, one of the first things I did was join NAFI, and it really helped me get a curriculum going and really kind of figure out what I wanted to do. So I very much appreciate this. Everybody live or recording or Facebook or however you all watching me, we need your help tonight. And if we don't get you tonight, you can always email us comments anytime. You can email me directly, Gary R at pilotsafety.org, or you can submit them to the NAFI. This is very much an audience participation type of class. So I want to talk about students who fail or failure. Everybody thinks failure is a bad thing, and, and certainly it can be depending on the student reaction to it. But I actually want to take the textbook dictionary definition of failure which is this, failure, click, next slide, there we go, <laughs> is not anything but 
a lack of success. They also describe it as defeat, washout, no-go. But lack of success is a temporary state. Defeat, washout, no-go is how somebody feels about it. I actually like the second definition, and that's the omission of expected or required action. They're just not doing what they need to be done yet. Now, the synonyms on this are a little strange. It's negligence or dere dereliction. There's two types of things. Negligence implies almost a willful ignoring of the rules or something. We can talk about that. But really, most of the time, they don't get to where they have to get yet is just a learning block. And we'll talk about that. So what's missing in all of these definitions? Well, nowhere in any dictionary does it say it's permanent. It doesn't have to be permanent. So a failure is simply a temporary setback most of the time. So as flight instructors, and Bob, I'd certainly love your comments too, when do you typically have to say no to a student? I always think of saying no to a student as no, you're not ready to solo yet. And well, in my, well, just briefly, uh, and, and I think a lot of other folks will have experiences they'll share. In my case, it's no, the weather's not quite as good as you think it is. You know, that's an excellent, you know, I didn't even think of that. You're absolutely right. See, I tend to think of things as student advancements, but that's a great add on, Bob. So I always think of saying no to solo. No, you're not ready for a check ride. No, I can't sign your flight review yet. No, I can't sign your IPC yet. No, I can't sign your rental checkout when I used to own a large flight school or work for flight schools. What else to the people in the audience? What else, when would you have to say no to a student? I like Bob's that no, the weather's not good for you today. Anybody in the audience have something that they want to add? They may want to come back to that. They, uh, it, it, there's sure. sometimes a little lag as we go through these. They'll, they'll catch up to us here. Okay. So let's talk about the primary responsibility of the CFI. It's not to get people to a check ride. The only responsibility of the CFI is to make sure their student stays safe. So what are some other CFI responsibilities? Well, I've actually seen these on Facebook that they need to train students till they pass the check ride. They need to accept all the students they can, and they need to keep training students until they succeed. Well, I look at it just a little bit differently. On the first one, I don't think you should train students to pass the check ride. I think you should train students to be safe and better than the minimums. I've heard a lot of people over the years that they train to a specific examiner's check ride. The examiner's gonna do this. Well, they shouldn't care what the examiner does. When you pass a, uh, a student for a check ride, they should be able to go to any examiner in the country and have a pretty good chance of passing. Now, one thing I think, especially new CFIs that are trying to build time will do, or older CFIs like me who are trying to pay for their wine collection that they shop out in Napa, is they try and accept all the students you can. Well, I'd really like to see CFIs only accept the students they are qualified to teach. Now, I'm really great at like four things and, and only four things. I'm one of the top experts in single pilot IFR using GPS, autopilots, and technologies like ForeFlight. That's what I do. So if somebody asked me two days ago, hey, um, I have a friend, he's very wealthy, he'd like to send his son to you to do his private pilot, he doesn't care what it costs. No. It's, it has nothing to do with what I charge per day. I would be really bad at training a private pilot. I haven't trained a private pilot for a check ride in five or six years. I wanna send those people to somebody who's better at it than me. Somebody asked if I could finish off their commercial. I don't think I could even spell Shondell, let alone do one, right? So when I owned a big flight school in Los Angeles, a, a former instructor of mine that split off and went her own separate way and best of wishes to her would tell people in the pilot shop that she's an expert at Garmin 
and she'd never flown a G1000 equipped airplane. That's not fair to the student. So one of the instructors I re uh, really respected most at Long Beach, a competing flight school, he's an expert in single pilot IFR. Every one of his students before the check ride, he'd send over to me for three days because he didn't do GPS. Just ne thought it was a fad, he was never gonna do it. So he would send his students to me at competing flight school for me to teach how to use the Garmin 430 or the old KLN 89Bs, and I would send people to him for mock check rides. And the last thing is, I think it's almost a personal affront to an instructor when a student has a block or they fail a check ride, and they want to keep training students until they succeed. I'd actually just say, let's keep training students until it's not helping anymore. So we've actually got a comment. Um, and this is from Mike. Hey, Mike, that another reason times he says no is the cross country solo is beyond their ability at the time. And that's a perfect example too. That's so, a great example. So and what, I like, yeah. and I like your examples of having sometimes to say, no, I'm not the right person. Absolutely. That's hard. That is hard. That is really hard for us to do as human beings. Absolutely. And I think there's, there's two kind of driving factors beyond all CFIs. All CFIs, when they start, are trying to build time in one way or another. Maybe not to get the airlines, but trying to get more experience. And all CFIs do have rent to pay. And I think it's a scarcity mindset that I have to take every student who wants to give me money, even though they may not be the best for that person. I turn down students all the time because it's just not what I'm good at anymore. I just don't do that stuff. So what causes student failure? So let's, let's talk about failure and, and what causes almost every student failure. Well, I'm gonna tell y'all, the thing that causes student failure is the same thing that causes every argument in every married couple worldwide, and that is expectations. And what causes every argument in every married couple worldwide is when those expectations are unclear. Perfect example, my wife, amazing woman, she puts up with me, I don't know why. We have this unclear expectation occasionally. We are both hungry, but I expect to go out, she wants to stay home. That combating point of view, then that brings up disappointment on one or both of us. So unclear expectations on a student can really lead to them failing. and. A classic example is what most people think are the IPC requirements. So most people, and I've heard many instructors and many students over the years say, I need an IPC, so I need to hire an instructor for an hour, and we need to do six approaches, a holding procedure, and an intercept and track course. Well, that's a completely unrealistic expectation because that is truly false. That is not the requirement for an IPC. An IPC is when they're out of currency and they haven't done all of those within the last six months. But let's stop right there. Let's say a student does an IPC and they do one with me and I do these three day courses all over the country and we cover every single one of these, everything for a flight review, it's an over 20 hour course. And in three days with me, they'll do 12 approaches and then they don't fly at all for six months would they be legal to fly a three hour IFR cross country in the soup and shoot an approach down to minimums? Yeah, but they're certainly not gonna be proficient. So if they haven't stayed proficient for the last six months, and then they've gone another six months where they didn't get current on their own, just doing six approaches in a hold is not gonna help them. That's why all of this is actually legally required. And I'd love to tell you about a really good friend of mine named David, who is an excellent pilot. And David had this really beautiful Cessna 303. And this is the first scenario we're gonna talk about. If you don't know, Cessna 303 is kind of an underpowered 310. It's the last production twin that Cessna ever made. So here's some relevant, relevant facts about David. He's a really smart pilot. He's great in business. He's a very smart human. I call everybody a smart rat, meaning he knows his way around the maze. 
He's owned this airplane for over 15 years, but it's got some new technology in the plane. He installed an Avidyne. He's starting to use ForeFlight. And a relevant fact is he's over 65. Now, everybody out there before you light the torches and grab the pitchforks, over 65 is not a handicap. But a 20-year-old who grew up flying with technology learns new technology a little faster. It's just somebody that's over 65 that flew for 30 years before that is used to the old steam gauges. They're not used to the computerized technology. So it's always just a little bit more of a challenge. Not that they can't do it, they certainly can. But I found older students just take a little bit to get used to the new technology. Another thing is he really just doesn't fly IMC very often. So we did this great three-day training. He was having a lot of fun. And then it came up to the last day of training. We're doing instrument procedures. He's getting better. He's getting better at the technology. He's flying mostly to standards. And on the way home from the cross country, I just looked at him and said, okay, just to be done with all this, the last approach will be single engine. And he was truly surprised. In fact, when I looked over his face, he looked exactly like this. I don't want to do it. I was a little puzzled. So I said, well, why not? And then the student said, well, shutting down an engine is going to hurt the airplane. I go, well, we're not, we're just going to do a simulated failure. And then he said, well, that's going to hurt the airplane too. Uh, no, it, it's actually in chapter four of your POH. It's, it's a normal procedure. And then he said the thing that really caught me off guard my last seven instructors didn't want to do one. I was truly blown away. I was actually truly frightened. He hadn't been any single engine practice in over 10 years. 10 years, he'd never practiced any single engine. Now listen, he's a great pilot if everything's working. So I go, well, what do you mean your last seven instructors didn't want to do one? Well, the local instructors here, they don't really have any 303 experience. And, and, and they say they're uncomfortable doing single engine work. Bob, that's when I go back to you pick the wrong instructor. There they you go. shouldn't be doing flight reviews in airplanes. They're not comfortable doing. I will tell you, I, I, I've been in sales all of my life. And I will tell you, I've always made more money by referring people out to somebody more qualified because they always brought me more money back later. You know, I have a, I have a good friend in the, in my day job. who has got a great saying. He says, sometimes the best customer service is to say no. Absolutely. We really do somebody a disservice by taking their money as an instructor when we're not good at what they need. It's not fair to us. And it's certainly not fair to them. I mean, if we look back at the IPC requirements, it very clearly says emergency operations are required. Yep. So this is how I handled it. I simply gave them a choice. Listen, you don't want to do single engine? No problem at all. I will log all of the training you've done, but I can't sign your IPC and I can't sign your flight review. Well, that's not fair. The other instructors did it. I know, but I can't legally do it. And it's not worth me because I won't be able to sleep at night. He goes, what do you mean? I go, if you ever got hurt, I'd never forgive myself. So the other choice is we can do simulated single engine. And if you do it to standards, I can sign your IPC. Well, I haven't done one in a long time. Not a problem. We may have to do more than one. And I'll tell you this, his first single engine, it was rough. When I first pulled that simulated failure on him, he really struggled. And all I can think back is the damage those previous instructors could have done. If he'd been alone and he'd had a low altitude, I just think it would have turned out horribly wrong. But he did get better. And the result is he got this goal. I actually signed his IPC. And the moral of the story is this. I failed him because I didn't cover the expectation that we were going to do single engine work as part of the ground review. 
I didn't tell him. Yeah. I just assumed he knew. Can I share, may I share a brief war story that's kind of similar than? That'd be great. I, um, years ago, a gentleman came to me with a beautiful A36 Bonanza. Had everything in the world in it, dual 430s, blah, blah, blah. Just a great airplane. And <clears throat> we, um, yeah, an S-Tech autopilot. And that that's the key to the story. Well, we did everything. And he the whole time he'd been bragging to me about how he, how he always hand flew everything because he wanted to stay proficient. So the last scenario, and this had happened in the uh, St. Louis area, the last uh, scenario was, well, you went down to Sykeston with your family, went to uh, Lambert's, had one too, one too many throat rolls. You're not feeling good. You need the autopilot to fly the approach because you're just not, you know you can't fly this ILS. And he looked over at me and said, I don't know how to couple the, couple the autopilot to the ILS. I said, you've got to be kidding me. And he said, well, I'll just hand fly. I said, no, if you can't, if you can't figure it out, we're going to land. We're going to read the manual. And because I didn't bring this up beforehand, I won't charge you any extra time. But we're going to let, if we have to land and figure it out, we will. Now, to his credit, he worked it out in the air without my help. I was pretty right. impressed. But same kind of thing. And who'd have, who'd have thunk in a well-equipped airplane like that? He, he'd say, I don't know how to do it. It, see, that's funny. That's a great story. That's, I think that's why I sell so many of my, my master training videos on GPS and autopilots and stuff like that. Most people that are really good pilots only know about 30% of the new technology can do. But you just kind of assume it's in their airplane. They know how to work it. I've had something very similar happen to me. So, you know, everybody, what I suggest you do is I suggest you print out and email a copy of the IPC course guidance to your clients before you do an IPC. The biggest problem we have is that people expect an IPC to be an hour. They expect a flight review to be an hour because that's what they've been taught by other instructors and that's what they've heard other pilots say. So when you say, well, an IPC and a flight review is a three-day program, I get a lot of, well, wait a minute. I'm like, but this is what we're going to cover. It doesn't certainly never has to be three days unless they really need help. But if they saw what the FAA recommends, they'd be really willing to be safer pilots. And the other expectations that get people in trouble is simply unrealistic expectations. So another scenario of mine is had a very smart client buy a pressurized 210. Great. Well, he was a smart pilot. So the relevant facts on this one, he's a smart pilot. He's actually been very successful in three or four businesses. He's done very well for himself. This guy is very smart. But he's never flown a pressurized airplane. And he's got some new technology. He's got a Garmin 530. He wants to learn four flight and his age is over 70. Now again, not saying 70 is old, but he didn't grow up playing computer games like I did, okay? So his expectation was this. In a five-day program, I could complete an insurance checkout, a flight review, an IPC, he could become familiar with the Garmin 530, and become familiar with four flight all in five days. Okay. Well, the expectation in five days says all that stuff. Oh, and just one more thing. Click slide. There we go. He hadn't flown in 14 years. Oh my. Now, I think everybody out there would agree that a pilot who hasn't flown anything in 14 years has done VOR and ILS on steam gauge, has never flown a pressurized aircraft, who needs an IPC, a flight review, an insurance checkout, getting good at Garmin and for flight all in five days, that is a big gamble. 
Like that's a lot, right? So we gave him some homework though. I said, look, absolutely we can try and do this, but three months ahead of time, I gave him over 15 hours of some advanced master training videos, the stuff I have on single pilot IFR, four flight and Garmin 430. And what's hilarious is like a Garmin GTN, the best new shiniest thing Garmin has, my videos are three and a half hours. Avidyne, best FMS on the market, three and a half hours. My four flight videos are almost nine hours long because it's much more complicated. So I said, look, you got a lot of videos to watch before I get there. Oh, and by the way, I need you to really study the POH. And I told him the day he gave me the deposit, this may extend to a second trip because you may, may need more time to achieve the goals. And he agreed to everything. So I was pretty clear in expectations up ahead of time that you may need more time. And we've got a great comment from Mike. Hey, Mike. He says, maybe think of the initial meeting as establishing a contract. And, I, you know, I like the way that it, I'm not saying you need to sign contract with everybody. But what he says is with a contract, the parties set expectations and conditions acceptable to all pilot, all parties before signing. And that's a great comment. Thanks, Mike. So I showed up 90 days later, and this is what's happened. He has not read the POH. He's watched some of the videos. And during the whole five days we were there, Bob, we only got to fly three times. He had bought the plane from somebody else that had passed an annual, but there were lots of little maintenance issues, like, oh, gee, the right brake doesn't work. Oh, gee, this doesn't work. So we were only able to fly three times for maybe an hour and a half, two hours in the whole five days. But I did give him over 20 hours of ground on the aircraft systems and I re IFR review while I was there because he paid for five days going to train for five days. Here's the problem. I can't sign him off. Like he's gotten like, he can't land the plane without assistance. Super nice guy, but he's so fixated on stuff that he loses sight of the big picture. So the first thing he says is, well, I can land the plane alone. And this is one of the common reactions to student failure. Denial. I can land the plane alone. I'm better than you think I am. Well, uh, okay. And then he went on to another common reaction, rationalization. Well, it's the maintenance issues and he just needs a little bit more time. Now, I actually agree with both of those things, by the way, but rationalization is a common reaction to when a student feels like they failed. And then he goes on to the third classic, which is projection. He actually blames the previous owner. Well, I can't believe he didn't fix all these things and why didn't it you know, why didn't they catch all this stuff on the annual? Because an annual inspection doesn't test every single system. And just to top it off even more, he had some external pressure. His wife, very sweet lady, one of my favorite people in the world, she's upset now too. Why did my husband buy this plane now? Now he can't fly it. Well, those are all the students' problems, but now I have my own problems. And my problems are this. I really like this guy. I want him to be successful. And Bob, does it bother you when a student doesn't meet the goal because you want him to meet the goal? Of course. I mean, these people become close to us, whether we want to admit it or not. Um, you'd have to be a sociopath or some, probably not to care about your students. Um, you want them to succeed. Both I'd say for altruistic reasons, the right reasons, and also for selfish reasons. Nobody, I don't want to fail as an instructor. Right. Right. So, you know, I actually went back a second time and he booked me for another five days. And on the second, uh, third day of that training, the plane went down again, just a minor maintenance problems. The strut needed to be rebuilt, but the strut, had a problem on a Friday afternoon and nobody's going to fix it on the weekend. So now I have another problem. And the way my business works is I get a deposit, I get paid the rest when I show up. And it doesn't matter how much I get, I, I just get. But here's the problem. He owes me a lot of more money and I have two days that I can spend staring at him over his kitchen table and doing more groundwork. But he doesn't need more ground. He needs to fly that plane. 
So here are my possible actions. And this is where I'd really like to open it up to uh, people in the audience. Here's what I thought my possible actions are. One, I can stay and spend two more days doing the groundwork. I can charge him more money and say, I'll come back for another five days in the future. I can tell him, well, I'm sorry, I just can't help you anymore. Like I've tried and I, I, it's not going to work out. Or the worst thing and what he thinks is I can tell him he's just too old, that he's not going to master all of this new stuff. And maybe he should get a simpler plane or give up flying. What would you all do? What do you guys think you would do in that scenario if this all happened to you? This is this is a good one. And maybe because I'm on the, while well, we're waiting for some comments on this, maybe because I'm on the uh, cusp of two generations because as I tell people, I can use a slide rule and a smartphone uh, because of my age. Um, it's an inter interesting conundrum. Uh, I'd like to hear, I'd like to hear from, from, uh, our audience too. Well, and while we're waiting, I'd like to share a, a story from, I have a really good friend named Mike Jess, who's also a master instructor and he, he might be on tonight. He's also an American Airlines captain. He was actually doing an IPC for a friend of his. That's also a friend of mine. And it didn't go well. He's a little bit older and he passed the last IPC, but this IPC, he was really struggling. He was like really going through the localizer and not able to hold altitudes and not respond quickly to uh, radio calls. And this is a personal friend of both of ours. And when they landed, the guy got really frustrated. He goes, well, I'm not able to fly to your airline pilot standards. And Mike goes, well, they're not my standards. I'm not trying to ask you to fly like an American Airlines pilot. These are the published standards. And what actually happened there is after several more times, he just quit flying IFR. He just decided the workload had gotten too much for him at that time. But again, not because he was old. I, mm -hmm. I never think the age thing, the biggest problem all of these people have they don't get to fly every day. I agree. I have yeah. to agree with that. There's a uh, a comment from uh, from I'm going to mispronounce this. Adriel, I believe. Um, I um, the suggestion is, is find an instructor in the local area that you can partner with to help this person practice, with the understanding perhaps that you'll come back and do the sign offs, that you'll take the responsibility for the sign offs, but hand them off. To somebody who could use the business in the area that can help them get more time in the aircraft and get used to it. You know, I think that's really smart. Let's go to the next slide where it says, what would you do? And let's go to the next slide. And this is my favorite question to ask everybody. How do you eat an elephant? Anybody know how you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So Adriel, it's very close to exactly what I did. I think you're brilliant. This is what I did, y'all. I canceled out the money out. They said, you know what? I don't want the rest of the money. Well, but he's very honorable. He's very loyal. Uh, contracts are kind of good. No, you know what? I'm not going to take any more money. I'm going to go home early. I'm actually going to take a day vacation with my wife in your beautiful national park. And then we're going to go home a day early. I don't want to take any more money because I'm not helping at this point. And then I actually told him, you should stop hiring me for now. And exactly what Adriel said. I say, let's just do it in smaller, easier steps. So small steps are the key to passing or getting big changes and big achievements. So like a couple other people have said, is this. Listen, why don't you hire a local instructor for a flight review here at your airport in a rented Cessna 172? Well, I know how to fly a 172. And I go, exactly. 
You can concentrate on just getting traffic pattern. Now look, he did some great things in the 210. His stalls, his steep turns, beautiful. But let's just knock out a basic flight review and a rented 172. And then when you go to your winter home in Arizona in a couple months, hire a different instructor there in a rented 172 and get your IPC. Then what we'll do is we'll basically gonna break your heart. I don't want you to fly the P210 until your flight review and IPC is done. So you've already paid for the hangar. Get all the little maintenance bugs work out, put it in the hangar. Oh, well, you know, one of the local instructors said he'd love to fly in the pressurized 210 with me. No, the local instructor didn't have any P210 time. Just mothball it. After you get your flight review and IPC done, then we can finish the insurance checkout with me or another CFI. I don't care if he uses me. I'd love to see him again. He's a good friend of mine. I love flying where he lives or any qualified pressurized 210 instructor. I even recommended Chuck McGill down in San Diego because he's like the 210 king. So what are we going to do next? When a student struggles with a big goal, the best way to help is to stop trying. And when I say stop trying, just stop trying harder. It's just better to do smaller pieces of the same goal. And little achievements really improve the morale. And that's what he's doing. And I think I've heard that he's doing very well now. Yeah, and I love what I love what Mike says. Leave the best part for last so you don't give up on the nasty bits. So it's a little tacky, but uh, it's, a, it, it's a good point. You know, it, it, getting bogged down and trying to, make, trying to handle a pressurized aircraft while learning four flight and so on, that's a mm -hmm. lot to do. That's a yeah. lot to do. And my friend John Niehaus on Facebook, hey, John, he says, you know, due to maintenance problems, we may have to do it another time. And, and that's part of what I did. I said, look, let's get all the maintenance bugs worked out while you work on the smaller steps. Absolutely. Okay, so what are the instructor possible fears of saying no? So as instructors, we always have underlying things. Everybody has driving things. Everybody has their own personality. So I'm gonna be very general and I'm gonna ask for comments too. I think one of the biggest fears for instructors to say no to a client is it's a scarcity mindset. They're afraid of losing that income. Because if I say no to this one, what if nobody else wants to hire me this week? It's been the hardest thing for me all my life is I've been such a sales guy all my life that it's hard for me to say no to somebody who wants to pay me. Like I want to take every client, but I've learned, and I hope you all share with me too, that I'm not always the best solution. The other possible fear, and this is one that really impacts me. I want to be liked by everyone. I want everyone to love the Gary. Everyone get on Team Gary. You see me walking around in a bright pink shirt, go, hey, Gary. I want to be everybody's friend. So I'm afraid if I say no to a student on a flight review or even like I can't help you in this, that they won't like me anymore or they'll complain about me and then other people won't like me. Now, this doesn't affect me because, hey, I own the company. Well, actually, I guess my wife is my boss. That's usually the way she thinks it is. But if you are an instructor working for a flight school, you might be afraid, and I've heard this from retribution from the flight school, that you might get fired or you might get less clients or there might be retribution that way. What else? What else might scare an instructor from saying no? Uh, Y'all still will do it, I'm sure, if it's a safety issue, but what other concerns might you have? To say well, no to a student. Gaining a reputation as someone who declines customers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or being unfair, hard to work with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. That's and that's a big one. I think I think for a lot, I think you hit an interesting thing where regarding money versus ego. And I don't mean ego in the negative sense, but where where it, where it would hurt it 
I think for low time instructors that are trying to build up either to an airline job or corporate, and there's nothing wrong with that, as long as they're taking care of their students while they're on the way, there's the, there's the fear of loss of time, loss of income. I think for people who are dedicated to, well, I, that's an unfair, I just said it in an unfair way. People who want to stay on as instructors, whether they've gone on to airlines or, or whatever, I think that I think not being liked or losing a student because you had to be you had to give them tough love that's a fear. That is really a big thing. It really is and you know what's funny is I know some motivations for some instructors are I just want to build time. In fact, I actually heard an instructor say it in a pilot shop out loud. I hate teaching, I hate my students. I almost took them out back and strangled them. I'm like, dude, go banner toe. Yeah, I got to agree with that one. Yeah, like he just wanted to get the airlines. But as much as he didn't like teaching, I don't think for a minute he didn't care about the welfare of his students. Like he didn't want the best. He was just wrapped up in other things. I think that's why he said it. Well, let's go ahead and move on. And hey, everybody just keep making comments. And we, we appreciate the ones that are coming up. So if we click on the next slide, let's just cover the three or for basic student reactions to failure. And I, I hate to say it, this is all out of the aviation instructor's handbook. You know that the thing you memorized RUAC, you wrote, memorized it for the written test and the check ride, and then you threw it away? You know, going back and reading it, it's got some good stuff. It's just a little hidden sometimes. So rationalization is a pretty common reaction to failing at something. They always have excuses why. So, well, I couldn't do it because of work or family or I didn't have time to study. And all of that actually may be true. The hard thing about rationalization is some of it is still based in fact. You know, a great story, Bob, is I actually got sued. I owned a big flight school out in Los Angeles and I told a student, you've no-showed on all of these classes. The money you gave me is done and I'm not going to train you anymore. And you know, he actually filed a lawsuit against me. And in the lawsuit, it said, I deceived him because Southern California had weather that was not good for flight training. <laughs> what? What? Like, I, I don't understand. Yeah. I, I'm stunned by that one. Right. I'm like, where do you want to go? Projection. That's when they blame others. And in the lawsuit, he said, well, that I was deceitful and I wasn't clear and I didn't like him. Well, that part was true at this point. I truly didn't like the guy at that point. But the others weren't. But he would even blame other pilots. Well, they didn't top it off with gas. So I didn't have time to go out and solo. Well, if you'd gotten there early, you could have. One of the worst things and maybe sometimes the best is actually giving up completely. I've seen it. I've had friends tell me the stories. Is that sometimes not flying anymore is actually the best thing. And uh, several people on Facebook, uh, I put up a post in General Aviation Safety uh, maybe a month ago. Several people sent me suggestions and stories. I thank you all. And one of the best ones I heard was, a Navy instructor was working with a guy and he just couldn't do it. He just couldn't get it. The Navy didn't have any more time, any more money to get him through it. I have to wash you out. And he actually met that guy several years later and he said it was the best thing that ever happened to him. He was so nervous and so scared that being washed out of the Navy pilot program made his life way better. He got a better job that he liked. And by the way, actually went back and got his private pilot certificate. But being told no and giving up was one of the best things that ever has happened to him. And there is going to be a point in everyone's life where flying airplanes safely may no longer be possible. For the two clients of my friend Mike's, they keep flying, but they just do less work intensive stuff. So sometimes saying bye is the right thing to do, but it's always hard. It's hard on everybody. And then really the most common 
is denial. I'm not failing. And by the way, the best example of this was me. I got my, hi Panda. I got my private pilot in 44 hours. So obviously I knew everything and I was a great pilot. Got my instrument rating in 42. So truly I was the king of aviation. Went to a flight instructor for commercial. He wouldn't sign me off, Bob. Like you can't take the check ride. I'm like, I can do everything. He's all, no, you can't. He sat me down and he's the best instructor I ever had. He was actually a Wells Fargo banker that quit because he liked flying so much. And he actually liked jumping out of airplanes more than he liked being in them. But Harry Leitcher made me a pro. And he sat me down one day. He goes, look, you're an idiot. You're going to kill yourself. And I've got proof. And he actually would take pictures with his phone and show me, look, dude, your altitude was off by 500 feet. And I didn't believe him until he showed me those pictures. So some ways to help denial. Sometimes you got to give them a little concrete proof. One of my favorites and, uh, and real good friends of mine, Cloud Ahoy. I just honestly think every instructor out there ought to be using the Cloud Ahoy. I used to use the Cloud Ahoy just to record the taxi because I loved it when my students would say, I'm on center line. I'm like, no, you're not. And then I'd lay out the ground track. Ta-da, you're really not. Cloud Ahoy gives them concrete proof because you're taking it out of I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah. You're taking out the personality. But you say you're awesome, let's look at the replay. And that really helps, by the way. When I taught uh, at the big school I owned in Los Angeles, a lot of my students finished much quicker than the national average. And I think it was not due to me. I mean, I think I was okay. But giving them an hour after every flight lesson of this is what we did, giving them that replay really helped. You can also just show them the four flight track log. Mm -hmm. and, and I've that done helps. that. I've done that. And have you ever had the flip of it, though, where somebody said, I'm not as good as you say that I am? And you have to show them and say, look, this is a darn near perfect approach. I do that all the time. I actually do that all the time in my three day programs. Mm -hmm. because I have them hand fly a DME arc using no panel for flight only. And they, I go, how was it? And they go awful. And I show them the cloud away. And I'm like, no, you did great. So another way to help people in denial, let's take me out of the picture. Let's get another instructor's opinion. Let's, let's just let somebody else with no personal interest in this, Talk them through it. So important notes, though, when you recommend another instructor, there's some really important things. I want you to give just the facts. Don't add your personal opinion of the student at all. Don't add what you think their problems are. Don't add any emotion at all. So basically, if you had to write out the problem with no adjectives, in one sentence, he's having trouble learning to land. That's all you want to give the other CFI because you want that person to have a clean, free shot. Now, listen, there's a risk to doing this. They may decide they like the other CFI better and just stay with that person. Okay. Notoriously, in all my career of teaching, when I've had somebody really struggle, like I, they can't get that grease landing down. They, they just can't get the flare down. When I send them to another instructor for two lessons, they came back better than ever. And, and they usually came back. But just that one outside perspective really makes a difference. And other instructors, by the way, will start doing the same to you, which is a great prep for the check ride. Because if they've never flown with anybody but you, the examiner can be pretty intimidating. So even doing a mock check ride with another CFI is a great thing. So other ways to help denial, just send them to that other instructor because the biggest uh, different method may work and they may actually accept the outside opinion. So we're running out of time. I want to get through the, the slides. I think we've been telling too many stories or probably me, but I'll blame Bob for this. 
saying no to a flight review. Really, really important is that you document the training they received. You never put the word failure in their logbook because you can't fail a flight review. It's not possible. They receive training, you log the training. You show them the ACS standards before. And by the way, just don't do flight reviews. I haven't done a flight review in 10 years. I only use the FAA WINGS program to do flight reviews. And here's an example, because the reason I love the flight, the WINGS review is it's a checklist. You have to do these things to standards. I sign that they completed those things to standards. The FAA issues the flight review. So what are some of the worst case scenarios, complaints and lawsuits. So let's talk real quickly about customer complaints. The best defense to customer complaints or lawsuits is simply documentation. If you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. So the more you write down and take a picture of their logbook every time you sign it. So if the customer does sue you or challenges a credit card, which has happened to me, one each over the last 14 or 15 years, there are some things you gotta know. And those things are this. Your opinion means nothing. Your personal opinion means Zippo. Documentation is the only thing that's gonna do any proof at all and be ready to lose anyway. Small claims court and credit card charges, if you do everything right, you can still lose but you can walk away knowing that you did the right thing. A client uh, of mine struggled very hard to get ready for his instrument rating. He was not successful. 11 months later, challenged a credit card, and he won, even though I had all the documentation. I lost a little bit of money, but I sleep good at night knowing I didn't sign him off for something he wasn't ready for. But what's the real worst case scenario? Money means nothing. It's an unsafe pilot. And the most dangerous people are the ignorant. And that's what makes somebody really dangerous. So what makes somebody dangerous? Well, a blatant disregard of the rules, extreme anti-authority, extreme anger, medical problems, or even drug and alcohol problems. And when that happens, you've got to take other action. And that other action is... Well, if you believe someone is truly dangerous and you work at a flight school, you got to tell a flight school. And if you think somebody's really dangerous, you must tell the FAA. At which point everybody goes, no, we hate the FAA. I'm not a rat. I'm not a rat. It's not about being a rat. It's about doing what's best for them. Because what if you don't report them? Well, if you don't report them and they get hurt, how will you feel about that? What if you don't report them and they kill their whole family, which are innocent people, which is what happened in this picture right here. Now, what happens to you if you do report to the FAA? Well, you're going to be asked to show your documentation and nothing else. They're not going to investigate you. It doesn't go on your record. And I love this African proverb, a clean conscience makes a really good pillow at night. So let's keep going, and I'm just going to finish these last few slides pretty much as fast as I can. And this is a time for review on your test later and just really the key points of, of what we've hoped to share tonight. A really good CFI does several things. They set clear expectations up front, which helps students overcome failures because with clear expectations, they won't have that. They'll share stories of their past problems. I love telling students how I almost failed my instrument check ride, how I wasn't ready for a commercial check ride, even though I thought I was. A good CFI also refers students to other instructors. They never give in to outside pressure. If a, if a flight school owner or a chief pilot's pressuring you to do something you're not comfortable with, they know when to walk away. And they know that some students have limits. In fact, all students have limits. We just got to get there. A good CFI is more concerned with safety than money. They recognize problems early and they understand the different student reactions and never take it personally. 
A great CFI will tell a student no if needed, will report someone that's truly dangerous for their own good. And a good CFI will, I think we just did this, will tell a student no. Next, uh, click on the next slide. I think we had a little duplicate there for me. Keep going. Oh, and the last part is stay active in NAFI for continuing education. All the great instructors I've ever known are active in instructor organizations and they're active in wings. They never stop continuing education, which is why I'm so excited to be part of NAFI. And they even have a professional development program that's specifically designed to make instructors better than that. Bob, did you want to say anything on that? Well, you mentioned the professional development program. We have our master CFI and we have the magazine uh, e-mentor, just being engaged. And of course, the WINGS program, the best way you can learn learn anything about flying and about yourself is to teach somebody else. So the WINGS program doesn't just benefit the student, it benefits whatever level the student is, it also benefits the instructor. So all of these things are great, are great programs. Right. Now listen, if you all want to learn anything more about me or the four or five things I'm really good at, if you go over to pilotsafety.org, I sell online and DVD master training videos for Avidyne, Garmin, ForeFlight, and Mastering Single Pilot IFR. And I'm actually partnering up with a really good friend of mine, Jason Chapper. Jason and I are doing a two-day aviation mastery program in Orlando, Florida on the 8th and 9th. And uh, if you just, when you buy your tickets, enter NAFI in all caps, because you're engaged, we'd love to give you 10% off. I think we have time for maybe just one or two questions. And this is from Carrie Mackey. And I actually know Carrie Mackey on Facebook uh, because, uh, hey, we're, you know, we're all Texans at heart. And he's a Texan in uh, East Texas. I'm a North Texan. North Texans are just slightly better than East Texans, by the way. But we'll, we'll go into that later. And he says he's a new CFI. He had a client approach him about conducting a flight review. Turns out he's been out of the cockpit for years. He flew with another instructor for 10 hours over Christmas before coming to me. He's been flying with him for the past several weeks, two to three times per week, all just over 15 hours with me, and he's just about to be ready to sign off. It's almost like going through his private all over again. And Kerry, that's the way to do it. And he goes on to say about how he set expectations early and that is why I'm so impressed with people like you. Does anybody else have any questions? Or Bob, do you have anything else to add here at the end? Well, I'll just add this. Um, for everybody who's listening, and, and uh, if it builds anybody's confidence, because we it is a good thing to talk about our failures, I blew my CFI initial. I blew the short, I blew the soft field landing by making it the greatest short field you've ever seen. So, <laughs> so before the nose gear even came down, I looked over at the examiner, said, can I try it again? He said, come back next week. So, yeah. and you share that with your students and they look at you and they say, wow, that really happens. So, yeah. Yeah. by the way, I just to clarify, when you, your program with Jason, that's on February 8th and 9th, did you say? Yeah, it's the, maybe it's the 9th and 10th, it's the weekend in February. Okay. Uh, you just and, said you just gave the date, so you can give the month. That's what oh, I said. Yeah. It's, in, it's in February, and if you go to aviationmastery.org, that's where we'd, we'd love to see y'all. All right. Well, I really appreciate your time. Uh, we, we did have to hurry up at the end there because this is a really engaging topic, and I think we'll have you back to talk some, some more about this because it is tough to say no to students and uh, because we do care about them and we do want them to, to do well. And so... Gary, I really appreciate uh, appreciate your time and uh, your effort on this tonight. And thank you for having me, and I'd, I'd love to be back anytime. And thank you all to everybody who's watching this. You know, it's the, the instructors that stay active in continuing education programs like NAFI, you guys are the real pros. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for saying that. And could you give your uh, give your web address one more time so, every, so if folks have questions they want to send you? And you're also on Facebook. Oh yeah, I'm always on Facebook and you're welcome to friend me there. If you if you ever want to talk to me, hear about anything I want to do, uh, go over to pilotsafety.org, pilotsafety.org, and you can get to me and do anything you want. Great. Thanks. 
Well, a little bit more housekeeping here for everybody. A uh, couple of quick reminders to help you get the most from this program. If we could, uh, there we go. Um, this course qualifies for credit in the Fast Team Wings program. For those viewing during the uh, partial sh shutdown this year, the quiz will be later, <coughs> will be available at a later date. We'll post the link on the course page when, it become, when that quiz becomes available. If you registered to attend tonight, you'll receive an email notice that the quiz is activated. We, we appreciate your patience. It's just that the folks who do that uh, in Washington aren't, aren't available right now. Remember, your input helps NAFI provide better features and benefits. Completion of the course evaluation earns a chance to win a NAFI 50th anniversary shirt. If you want to watch this program again, and I can't imagine you wouldn't, uh, you can view any previous mentor live or share these programs with your students or friends. Just go to the NAFINET.org page. Uh, let me try that again, NAFINET.org page to get those links. So really appreciate your time tonight. Thanks for attending. Have a uh, slightly belated Happy New Year, but have a Happy New Year. Fly safe and... Take care. We'll see you next time.